back up. But they had, you know, they had a, the, a wonderful week this past week with VBS, uh, Vacation Bible School. Thank you to all of you who have participated with that, uh, v, with the VBS, whether you were up front or you were behind the scenes, you were there during the week or you couldn't participate, but you wanted to participate. Um, it, it was all just so amazing. And so thank you so much to all of you uh, who just have put in so much time, so much time with VBS. It really was a, a great experience. Now, for those of you who uh, remember in VBS, you know, everybody kind of like got paired up in crews, right? You had a crew leader, like one or two crew leaders who were the older students, uh, as well as the, the younger uh, campers who were there with them, you know, groups of about five. And at first, like the first couple days, I know it's always awkward. You're getting to know each other. But by the end of the week, you know, you were able to really, really bond together as a group. And it's so cool to see that, especially like the, um, the end of the week skits that people did, where it was like really fun. You could see their personalities. And you know, you know how you get together when you, with a certain group of people and you spend time together, you kind of develop inside jokes. Or you know stuff that you're like all really good at. And so, you know, some people did like Chinese yo-yo. Other people did like gymnastics or like skits or something like that. It was really fun just to see how those groups had bonded, how the crews have bonded. It takes time, doesn't it? Because not, not everybody's there right away. And so this week, we are studying in our series in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus forms his crew. Obvious BBS tie-in. I just, I figured I, I had to say it. Jesus assembles and forms his crew of followers. And so this week, we are looking at the story where Jesus assembles his crew. And then we want to consider what it means for us centuries, generations, thousands of years later. What does it mean for us to pose this question? What does it look like for us to be in Jesus' crew? What does it look like for us to grow together as followers of Jesus ultimately seeking to pursue what Jesus has called us to do and who Jesus has called us to be. Because as we've been studying in the Gospel of Matthew, the idea that Jesus has come into the world as the king of all creation. And we ask ourselves this question, well, what does it look like then for us to have Jesus as the king of our life? You know, that's a very personal question to ask. But the reason why we ask that question, what does it look like for Jesus to be the king of my life, is because the Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as the long-awaited king who has returned as part of God's faithfulness. And so in just a moment, I'm actually going to take some time to read from Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, the story of Jesus assembling his crew. You know, for those of us who may be maybe more familiar with the Avengers, you know, Avengers assemble, it's the same thing. Jesus is assembling his crew, not just simply to sort of exist as a group of individuals, but as a new identity. And so we're reading again from Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 23. And so if you would like to follow along in the Pew Bibles, the page number should be in your bulletin, or if you have your own Bible that you want to read, the words will also be on the screen. Later on in the passage, later on in the message, I will refer to the passages. They may not necessarily be on the screen. So again, I would encourage you, whether it's looking at the physical copy of the Bible or seeing the exact words of the Bible projected on the screen, whatever helps you, go ahead and do that. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First there was Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. These twelve Jesus set out with the following instructions, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any of the towns of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely 
you have received, and so freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, no bag for the journey or extra shirts or sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for a worthy person to stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home go, or leave that town and shake the dust off your feet. For truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, don't worry about what you're going to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death. Father will betray his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one town, flee to another one. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. As we hear God's word, let's ask him to help us understand it this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that... Jesus is the proof that you have not given up on this world, but you have committed yourself to fix what is wrong because you love this world, you love your creation, you love us as your image bearers. You love us so much that you sent your son Jesus into this world to show us what it means to be a human, to follow and love you and to love others. And when Jesus on the cross took the penalty of our sin, sin being condemned, we were able to be forgiven and freed. And so we pray that as we consider what it means to be part of Jesus' crew, the message that the kingdom has come would be rooted deeply in our life. Amen. Amen. So we just read this passage about how Jesus has assembled his crew to proclaim. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't just gather a whole bunch of individuals, give them individual messages, and send them on their way. No, Jesus assembles a crew to be part of his mission. And one of the things you might notice about this crew, maybe you don't, maybe you're not familiar with the Bible, and if you're not familiar with the Bible, I'm really glad you're here this morning. But Jesus and his crew, especially the crew members of Jesus, are very unexpected because they are not impressive people, at least by the world's standards. They are not political leaders. They are not rich. Well, one of them might be, for bad reason. They are not particularly politically powerful, even though one of them is desperately seeking to gain political power, not necessarily for himself, but for the people of Israel. They are, by and large, rather unimpressive. And they are, in many ways, unlike each other. Now, of course, there are some similarities because they're all men, and they're all part of the nation of Israel. But there's two people in particular that I referenced earlier that are very unlike each other. One, you have Matthew. Matthew is a person who has figured out, you know what, the Romans are in charge here. And so I'm going to find a way for myself to flourish, to be okay. I'm going to sidle up to the Roman government and become a tax collector. And so the Romans, when they would conquer a place, would oftentimes... Uh, give very, very steep, expensive taxes to the local populace. The peace of Rome doesn't come cheaply, after all. And so what Matthew would do is that he would go around and he would collect the taxes, or people would come to him, and whatever he wanted to charge, and this, is what, this isn't just what Matthew did, this is what tax collectors did. 
they would also charge interest on top of that, whatever they felt necessary to keep their standard of living comfortable. You know, maybe Matthew wasn't necessarily like that. He wasn't like that. He wasn't, you know, ripping people off. He wasn't that bad of a guy. But ultimately, what he represented was being a sellout. And one of the other members of Jesus' crew had a big problem with Matthew being a sellout. Simon the Zealot. There's a couple times in the Bible where people are referred to being zealous. And those stories always include violence. When people are willing to take matters into their own hands and ultimately kill people who they believe to be polluting the purity of God's people. And so Simon was one of the underground movements known as the zealots. Think of like terrorism. You know, it depends on who you talk to about who the terrorists are. Guerrilla warfare, freedom fighters who would have been so disgusted by the idea of a tax collector that they would have considered them just as as evil, just as corrupt. And here Jesus is calling together two people who by all strands of the world's imagination are enemies. They could have very well, Simon very well, could have wondered at times, maybe it would just be easier for me to kill Matthew because he is personification of a sellout. And yet Jesus calls them not simply just as individuals, but also to be part of his new people. You see, what Jesus is doing when he calls these people together is that he is actually replaying the story of Israel in the Bible. What Jesus is doing when he calls together these 12 men is that he is rebuilding the nation of Israel. It's so important for us to understand the historical context of the Bible, because if we don't, then we miss so much about what Jesus is doing. When the nation of Israel came back from exile hundreds of years before Jesus, the entire nation didn't come back. Actually, really only two tribes came back. And so they were back in the land, but not everybody was back. And they weren't free. They were under Insert political dominant group here. The Greeks, the Romans, the Persians. And so what what Jesus is doing is that he is actually, through this calling of his crew together, forming the new people of God. You see, what we want to understand is that God loves people. God's plan to fix what's wrong in this world involves using people. Now, oftentimes what happens is that when we read the Bible and we sort of follow certain theological trains is that we tend to see humans as everything that is wrong in this world. We're so desperately sinful that as soon as we touch anything, it just falls apart. But God loves people, and God loves to use people, not as mindless robots who have no will of their own, no personalities that are unique to them, but ultimately God loves to use people as part of his active, as active participants in his mission to fix what is wrong with the world. Now, humans are the problem. (laughs) What I said earlier, I'm not denying that. I'm not denying that the reason why what is, so, what is going poorly in the world is because of humanity's decision to walk around away from God. That is true. But if we only focus on that, then we have actually missed what God has created us to be. Let that sink in. Part of God's plan to fix what is wrong in this world, the plan that is centered around the person of Jesus, is to use people, is to use people. So Jesus assembles his crew. He gives them this new identity, and he gives them a mission, a mission to proclaim. So we have this new group of people. You know, oftentimes when a new business starts up, they're really, really gung-ho about letting people know what they're here to do. And the same thing with our English congregation. So often when we meet, I want to say, one of the things that we are here to do in our English congregation is to experience and embody the love of God. If you don't know that's what we're here to do as the English congregation, 
drill that into your brain because I might give you a pop quiz later. And if you don't know, that's okay. But Jesus calls his crew to do something, to go and proclaim the good news. Now, for many of us, when we hear that, oh, to go and proclaim the good news, we have a lot of preloaded assumptions about what that means. We think, oh, the, the good news means the gospel. And so he sends his people out to go explain about how everybody is a sinner and how their sin separates them from God and how Jesus has come to pay the penalty for their sin. But that's not the good news that Jesus sends his people out with. That is not the gospel that Jesus has sent his people out with. Now, let me clarify. Part of the gospel message involves that. Part of the gospel message involves the reality that our sin has separated us from God. And that Jesus had come to pay that price for us. But ultimately, the good news that Jesus has come to proclaim to us, and he sends his crew out to do, is to retell the story of the Bible. Matthew has been doing this all along. When you read Matthew in the context of the entire story of the Bible, everything that Jesus does seems to go back to the Hebrew scriptures of the, the Old Testament and replays it. That God has rescued his people out of of slavery, out of exile. He is regathering his people. Ultimately, the proclamation, the good news that Jesus proclaims in the gospel, the gospel of Matthew, the good news that we boil down into the word gospel is that the kingdom of heaven has come. It is not ultimately about where you go when you die, though that is certainly part of it, It is ultimately about what is happening right now in history in the person of Jesus. God has returned. The kingdom of heaven tells us. And through the presence of God, through his people, flooding the world, proclaiming the good news, healing happens, reconciliation happens, restoration happens amongst enemies of people who are now associated with Jesus. Think about that passage that we read in Isaiah chapter 35. One of the reasons, here's the thing, you may not always be aware of this, but one of the reasons why we read Old Testament and New Testament parts in our worship service is to help guide our thinking, to see how what Jesus has come to do is ultimately a fulfillment of a promise that God has made in our life. And so again, if you are new to this church, or even if you've been here this entire time, and you don't know why do we do that, that is why. Because ultimately what Jesus has come is to show that God has been faithful to his promise to not abandon his people, even though his people are part of the problem. He has been faithful in his promise to return. And that this good news about God's return is not something just about a disembodied spiritual existence, but it is for the here and now, for the healings and the hurts of this world. God has returned, Jesus has said in his message. And for those of us who know the storyline of the Bible, God has returned in the person, the physical flesh and blood person of Jesus of Nazareth, a person from a family of no great means, but of royal lineage. And so Jesus has said to his disciples, to his crew, go out and proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come. Now, I earlier had used that illustration about you know, this past week talking about, with some of the students about, like, my workout schedule. About, and they were saying, like, oh, Pastor Eric's so strong. Uh, Feel his biceps. It's like, first of all, if you want, like, people to feel, don't ask me to, this is, like, the weakest part of my body. Um, I don't know how to demonstrate how, like, my muscles when it's, like, uh, ask me to pick something really heavy up off the ground. But anyway, so if somebody said, oh, Pastor Eric, so one of the students asked me if I was a gym teacher. Um, And they go to this church, I was like, no, do you know who I am? Uh, but, but I think that's because they, they saw that, like, oh, and they saw me talking to people and, like, how I, like, work out. And what if somebody came to me and said, Eric, prove how strong you are. Actually, one of, two, two or three of, like, the younger camper girls 
really liked it to like grab onto my arms and I would do this with them. I would like butterfly, like lat, raise them. What if I couldn't do it? What if I couldn't do it? What if I couldn't prove what I was saying was true? Then there's no reason to believe that that's actually true, right? What happens if we go to the, the gym and I'm like, oh, Pastor Eric, you're so strong. Uh, bicep curl, that five pounds. And I'm like, well, I can't do it. And so what Jesus is doing is that he's giving his crew the proof that the kingdom of God has come. And here is in that story we see in chapter 10, verse 8, where Jesus gives them the commands to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Now we hear that, and the, part of us might ask this question, that's really cool, what in the world does it have to do with anything? That's a really good party trick, Jesus. And a lot of us might sort of see, like, oh, Jesus performed miracles, and therefore he's God. Well, lots of people performed miracles in, in the Bible's time. They weren't God. What specifically is it about Jesus and his command to, heal, to give to his crew to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons that reinforces that Jesus is the person in whom the presence of the God of Israel is living? You see, ultimately what we're doing is that Jesus is, in fact, replaying the story of the Bible. After God rescued his people out of slavery, out of Egypt, led them through the Red Sea, put up with them all those years in the wilderness, is that he set them on the doorstep of the promised land with the command to drive out, exterminate certain people groups who have become so corrupted and evil that God says they have polluted the land so much that the land literally has become sick of them and needs to vomit them out. Or we think about it in terms of the flood in Genesis chapter 6, where the earth has become so corrupted that God has opened up the floodgates of the waters above and the earth below. He's undoing creation, what he does. Except in this story, in the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua, God's flood of justice and judgment against the evil and the corruption in this world are his people. And there were certain people groups that had become so corrupted that God says they had generations to return or to repent, and they never did, so it's their time to go. And what's interesting about some of these people groups is that they would have actually cha uh, traced their genealogy. They would have been proud of the fact that their ancestors were the offspring of this Really strange story in Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they went and they took them and they had sex with them, and then their offspring became sort of these giant men, men of renown. It's this really interesting story in, in Genesis chapter 6, where it's like everything that is wrong in this world is personified by the offspring of these angelic sons of God and daughters of men's union. And God sees this and has become so wicked. And later on in the sort of, you know, I don't know if we want to call it cultural mythology of these people, they would have been seen as giants. If you study the cultures around them, they would have been so proud that the founders of Babylon were giants. The founders of Assyria were giants. The founders of the land of Canaan were these giants. And actually, when, when you go through the list of all the people that they were commanded to drive out, some of their kings are described as giants or descendants of these giants. And again, this is one of those things that, for many of us, we have no concept of. That story is totally foreign to us, but it would have been ingrained in so much of the thinking of the people around the time of Jesus. Joshua was commanded to drive them out. And now what Jesus is doing to his followers as well is he's commanding his crew to drive out evil as well. Except this time it's not nations, it's not kings, because ultimately those weren't the real problems. It was the spiritual evil that was behind it. Because in the days of Jesus and prior to that, people were writing about stuff, they were discussing stuff about how there was this correlation between like sickness and and death, and evil, and the descendants of these hybrid people. And so it would have been somewhat 
common sense for them to associate evil, the presence of evil, the reality of evil, with demonic, what we understand, demonic possession, maybe even illnesses, and especially death. Now, I know what you might be thinking as I sort of took that five minutes, sort of let's, let's take a step back and let's look at the context of Jesus' life and his world. And you might be thinking, does that mean that in every case now of sickness and illness and disease and death, it's, become a, it's because of some sort of dark spiritual force in this world? Some Christians say yes. Other Christians say no. So I'm not saying that. No, I'm not. And I know what you're thinking. Are we, therefore, as followers of Jesus, called to do the same thing? To heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. After all, there are some versions of Christianity that say, yes, absolutely, all Christians are called to do that. Whereas other branches of Christianity would say, no. And yet, nonetheless, Jesus is demonstrating again by giving his authority Remember how previously Jesus had said, as the Son of Man, who has authority to forgive sin. We remember that story in Daniel chapter 7, that the Son of Man is the personification of the faithful people of God. I gave my, crew, my, my game helpers this week pop quizzes about, tell me about who the Son of Man is. They had so much fun with me, it's hard to even imagine that I would do that. The Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 is the personification of the faithful people of God who endured in the face of wicked, evil persecution. And because even though they may have lost their life, we read in Revelation, they did not love their life so much so as to shrink from death. Because they were faithful when God showed up, when he judged evil, he raised them up in the picture of this Son of Man. And he seated them in the heavens and gave them rule and power and authority and people actually worshiped him and here is jesus saying i am that person i am the personification of the faithful person of god and i don't want to just hold on to my authority to lock it away in the closet and just have people sit over there because we all know people are the real reason why everything is so bad how often we think about jesus and god that way we just have been called to sit over on the sidelines and sing praise songs lest we mess something up but rather, Jesus shares his authority with his followers. And so, whatever debates there may be about that stuff I mentioned before, don't miss that. God loves to use people, and he shares his authority with them. They are not puppets, but they are part of his crew. So, I've been talking a lot about sort of understanding the context of the Bible I do that a lot. Have you guys noticed that? Like, it almost seems like I spend more time spend explaining the context of the Bible than I do explaining the, the passage. And so some people might just kind of walk away with like, okay, that's cool. Some of you guys might hear that and you're like, oh, Pastor Eric, he's, flex he's showing off. He's flexing his theological mus muscles. He's, he's, so, he's trying to show how smart he is by being so deep. I've heard both of them. And part, you know, part, of, the, part of the second one is, is kind of true because it's like, you know, I'm a person. I want people to think I'm smart. If, if you don't think that that's true, it is. I want you to think that I'm smart. I want you to think that I'm creative. I want you to think that I have a way of explaining things. Or I would imagine that even if you weren't part of that first two groups, there's probably many of you who are in this room who probably think, that's all well and good, but that is not relevant to me. Give me something practical. And believe me, I have definitely heard that. And I wrestle with that one a lot. But ultimately, what I want you to do, what I want you to do, I'm inviting you to do, is to think about what the Bible is about. How can we understand what Jesus has come to do unless we understand the story that he was born in? Unless we understand the story that Jesus grew up hearing, believing, and ultimately seeing himself as the central figure of its fulfillment. God has returned in Jesus. God has been faithful to his promise to rescue and restore his people out of their own sin, to restore them to be his vehicles of blessing, to demonstrate his faithful love to this world and how much he loves this world. God came in the flesh of Jesus, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the historical person, a person who loved to share his authority with his followers. 
And later on in the gospel stories, we will see that it is through the cross where Jesus forgives our sin, where sin is condemned on Jesus. And it's not just a legal transaction that happens, but it is actually a physical breaking of the power of sin and death in this world. The forgiveness of our sin is not just simply that we're not guilty anymore, but we are actually freed, freed to be God's people. And that through the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of God, we see Jesus as the one who has overcome death through his obedience to God as our substitution. The perfectly faithful one suffered the consequences of all the sin of this world. And because he was faithful even so much that he did not love his life so much as to shrink from death, or as Hebrews said, he does not shrink from the cross, but rather he went forward, and now because of that he is seated at the right hand of God, exalted as the king over all creation, including our lives, but of all creation. Jesus has come us come to do is to show us what it means to be a true human. Jesus warns his followers that following him, being part of his crew, will not be easy. There will be persecution. There will be family splits. We already saw about how Jesus says you have to, in relation to me, hate your mother or your father in relation to me. Leave the dead to bury their dead. And so what Jesus is saying here is not that much of a surprise to his followers. What Jesus is saying when he's saying that, the God has re- that God has returned in his work, he's prompting people with this question. How will they respond? Because when he tells his followers, when he tells his crew, that when you go and you give this message, if people reject you, they are not rejecting you. Again, they, they are not eloquent spokespeople. They have not been trained in evangelism. They don't have all of their stuff figured out. What they have been given is Jesus' authority. And if people reject that, then they are rejecting Jesus. And Jesus says it will be more bearable for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah than for those cities of my people that you go to. We might ask ourselves the question, why is it going to be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the the city that is the personification of evil, that was destroyed by God. It's because the people that Jesus is sending his followers to, they were God's chosen people. They were the people who God had commissioned to be his vehicle of blessing in this world. They had been exposed to the kingdom of God and the person and the work of Jesus that the city of Sodom and Gomorrah never were. And now because of that, they they are accountable. Jesus is looking at his nation. He's seeing everything that's going on. He knows the condition of the human heart, and he knows that they are on a collision course of God's justice in this world about what happens when his people continually reject his messengers and try to build kingdoms of their own using the weapons of this world. Jesus is saying that unless you repent, you will be destroyed. And he's saying this to people in his generation. And we know that what Jesus said ultimately did come true in 70 AD when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed their temple as an act of God's justice against the rejection of Jesus Messiah. But we also know that as Jesus talks about these things, it almost seems like he's talking about something in the future as well. Because he says in the context of his disciples, the people who endure to the end will be saved. There will be times where you're going to have to flee. There's going to be times when you have to leave. You're going to have to make that decision to say, I've worked really hard, but ultimately I have to survive. And there will be times when you have to leave. But it also seems like there's going to be times when you can't flee. And so what do you do? Jesus says in the face of the upcoming persecution that's going to happen in the lives of the followers of Jesus that we read about in the book of Acts, the one who endures will be saved. We should be careful not to sort of read in our individualistic understandings of praying to have Jesus forgive our sins and we say, I've been saved in that respect. I don't think that's necessarily what Jesus is talking about when he's saying the one who endures will be saved. Because, again, 
the story of the Bible is about what God is doing in this world. And the story of God all throughout the scripture where it talks about God being his people's salvation is that God rescues when it seems like all hope is lost. That sounds like a VBS thing, right? When all hope seems lost, God rescues. And yet we read in Revelation, there are times when it seems like God doesn't rescue in the same way that we expect him to. There's that vision where it says the people who have died during the time of persecution, they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. And it was by that word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb, they have overcome the evil one. Remember the context of Daniel chapter 7, when it talks about the Son of Man coming. It's not about the Son of Man coming from heaven, but it's about the Son of Man going to heaven, ascending to the throne of God because of his faithful endurance, even in the face of death, and because of his endurance, even in the face of faithful death, God ultimately rewards and saves them from condemnation and gives them authority. And Jesus says that if you endure, you will be given that same thing. And we saw that in Revelation. Endurance, Jesus said. Endure. So, as we wrap up this message, again, I know some people might say, Eric, you spend so much time talking about the cultural context of the Bible that it almost seems like you spend more time explaining that than what I'm supposed to do with the Bible. And to that I say, I understand. Part of the reason why I spend so much time explaining it is so that when we start to apply it to our own life, we do it in a way that is responsible. So we ask ourselves this question, how do I perform then as a member of Jesus' crew? Some of those commands that Jesus gave his followers don't apply to me. In fact, one of the reasons why I'm here today as a follower of Jesus is because ultimately Jesus temporal command to not go to the nations outside of Israel was lifted in the Great Commission. Go to all nations. Jesus told his followers, don't take anything. Uh, okay. What am I supposed to do with that? Don't waste your time with unresponsive people. Is that a good evangelism strategy in our day? Give them one chance and then see you later. Don't forget to bring some sand with you so you can throw it at them. Or put it in your shoe and shake it out. Don't prepare in advance what you're going to say. But in 1 Peter, it says we're always supposed to be prepared. And not to mention, it kind of seems like a wise thing to think about what it is that you would believe and come up with an answer for why it is that you have the hope in your heart. So, how do we do this as followers of Jesus? Well, we take that principle that Jesus gave his followers. And as we wrap up, we realize we need to become wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We need wisdom. We need gentleness. We need to be reminded that even though we may not necessarily be sent in the same way that his original followers were, we stay where we are, we should also learn to embody that idea that God will provide for us, that we don't need to worry and run after things, as Jesus told us in the Sermon of the Mount. We need to uh, trust and allow and realize that it is the Spirit of God that is working in us to transform us into people who are like Jesus, that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead also lives in you, that you've been called to faithful endurance, not just as an individual, where you can just kind of say, oh, I don't like how this church does one thing. I'm going to pack up and go to a different one. There may come times where that is the best choice to do, but it's not always, you know, just kind of because you don't like something, but to be called together to a people that God is working through, that even though they may not be perfect, because remember, God didn't choose Israel because they were the biggest or the strongest. Jesus didn't pick his disciples because they were the most obvious choices. In fact, it was the opposite reason for both of those things. And in the same way, when we let our weakness shine and we allow the power of God to work in our life, even in the face of extreme, frustrating persecution, not the kind of stuff that we think Americans and uh, Christians in America are suffering, but actual real-life persecution, or even just frustration, wondering in our own hearts, is it really worth to take up my cross and follow Jesus every day when 
I live a very comfortable life. And that might require me to give up some things. We are reminded that in the book of Romans, chapter 8, that if we are children of God, then we are heirs of God and co-heirs in Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Just as Jesus taught his followers, picking up that, pic that picture from Daniel chapter 7, sometimes God's people are called to endure so that they, in their vindication, in the reward that God gives them, they are able to experience the closeness and the presence of Jesus in ways that otherwise they couldn't have that their testimony in this world is stronger than just sort of a well-laid-out argument. Because ultimately what we are here to remember in this passage and what we are here to remind ourselves as we think about what, what is the gospel that Jesus proclaims, where we understand how we fit in as part of Jesus' crew, where our sins are forgiven, where, we, where we've been set free, where we've been given this new identity as Christ, in Christ, is that ultimately that the kingdom of God has come through the person of Jesus, and that the kingdom of God is proclaimed and lived out in the life of his followers as a sign of our hope when Christ returns. I'm going to close us in prayer, and I'm going to invite the worship team that, to come up and, and pray as we, as we are, are praying. And I'd just like to ask you, if, if that's something that you would like to know more about, about what it means to sort of, again, using the, v, the VBS term, being in Jesus' crew, what that looks like together, because we need help. We need help. We need to be able to reflect together. That's why in your bulletins, I put those reflection questions. So if you don't know the answer to it right away, take it home. Think about it. Ask God to help you. Talk to somebody else. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is through the passion of Jesus, the this, his suffering and death on the cross where our sins have been forgiven, that we have been set free so that we could experience true life, not simply as something that we will get when we die and, and, and be with you in eternity, but even now that the life that Jesus lives can be lived in us. Give us wisdom to know what exactly that looks like so that we could patiently endure, even in the face of sufferings or affliction, so that we would know following Jesus is worth it, the Son of Man who loves to share his authority with his followers. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.